let's, let's get into it. And you know these candidates, so I will just simply say we have with us three candidates for the office of U.S. Senate. John Cox, give him a round of applause. Everyone gets a round of applause. Jim Durkin. And Jim Oberlein. I don't get to pick, I get what's left. You're going first. <laughs> we go one, two, three, your opening statement. So we have a three minute opening statement on the key issues facing Illinois' next U.S. Senator. I give you Jim Oberweiss. Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank all the members of the City Club of Chicago for their sponsorship of this event, this debate, and uh, to thank you for taking the time out of very busy schedules that I'm sure all of you have as, as well as uh, we do and for coming to hear what we have to say on some of these issues. As I look out here today, I see many friends and successful entrepreneurs. It reminds me of something that Ronald Reagan said uh, quite a number of years ago. He said, the best minds are not in government. If they were, business would have hired them away. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you again uh, for listening to us today. Let me take just a few minutes and tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a lifelong Aurora, Illinois resident, uh, undergraduate degree from the University of Illinois in Champaign and an MBA from the University of Chicago. Been married to my wife, Elaine, for 34 years and she's been my business partner for the last 24 years. We have five children and six grandchildren. Actually, very, very soon will be seven grandchildren. It's here in Illinois that I really have spent my entire professional career. I'm an entrepreneur. I've started five or six different businesses in my life. The first one when I was in grade school. I'm currently president of Oberweiss Asset Management, which manages approximately $200 million for investors across Illinois and other states. And by the way, we own no shares of Enron <laughs> or Kmart, and have gotten no political contributions from Enron either. I'm also president of the Oberweiss Funds, uh, portfolio manager for two of our mutual funds, both of which were up last year, by the way, one of them up 24%, so we had a pretty good year. And I'm also chairman of Oberweiss Dairy, which I bought about 15 years ago. It's a 75-year-old family business. Uh, in the last 10 years, we've grown that from 5 million in sales to 40 million in sales, from one ice cream store to 21 ice cream stores, from 50 employees to over 600 employees. So again, business has certainly been very good. I'm really running for this office to protect our freedoms, freedoms that I think are extremely important. Many of us take those freedoms for granted, economic freedoms, freedom to start a business and succeed or fail based on our own merits, our own luck, and how hard we work, as well as religious freedom, freedom of speech, and all the freedoms that we find so so valuable in this country. And believe me, those freedoms are not available in many countries in the world today. So I think it's important that we do whatever we can to protect those freedoms. This is something that I believe I can do, something I can contribute, and I believe I can do well. So that's really why I'm running for the Senate. A campaign is about creating jobs and creating opportunities. I've had experience at doing exactly that. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the types of jobs that have been created at Oprah Weiss Dairy. Um, I believe that sending somebody to Washington who has the experience of meeting payrolls, the experience of creating jobs and opportunities would be a great addition to the U.S. Senate staff. Today we have a Senate that is heavily populated with attorneys and I think maybe squeezing one entrepreneur in there with a group of attorneys might make some sense. Uh, I believe that I have more real world business experience in starting businesses and creating those opportunities than my Republican opponents, or by far, than my Democratic opponent. And I think it's time that Dick Durbin get a little experience in the real world and get a chance to work in the private enterprise system and follow in the steps of Al Gore in that regard. So it's my goal to, to make that happen. As a U.S. Senator, my prior priorities will be on creating jobs and opportunities, making sure the economy is strong. I think that's something that's important to all of us. It will be on education. I didn't mention, but I'm also, uh, I started my career as a math and science teacher. 
So I understand some of those problems, and I understand what, what that's all about, and I believe it has some solutions to help improve our educational system. It's also on making sure that from an energy standpoint, we're hemispheric energy independent. And lastly, on keeping America safe and sound and making sure that uh, both for homeland security and international security, we continue to have the best trained, best equipped military fighting force in the world. I look forward to discussing these issues with uh, Jim and John, and I, th I thank you, Jim and John, for being here as well and, and joining us in this debate and sharing ideas. Thank you all very much. We'll now hear from uh, Jim Dorkin. Good afternoon. I thank the City Club for this opportunity, and uh, of all days, the 91st birthday of Ronald Reagan, and how fitting uh, of an event this should be. But uh, I'd like to first introduce uh, my father who's here today, uh, Tom Durkin. And thank you, Dad, for coming out here. And uh, I've got three of my brothers scattered in the audience, but uh, I come from a family of eight boys, and I'm a uh, father of four girls. So, uh, but uh, I'll tell you what the things are important to the state of Illinois. National defense, economy, job creation, education, energy. Um, we're going to hear a lot about that today. But that's, uh, those are the issues that are important to, in the state, but those are national issues as well. Uh, I am a member of the Illinois House of Representatives. I've served in the General Assembly for the past seven and a half years, representing the western suburbs of Cook County. I live in Westchester, Illinois. But uh, prior to serving in the General Assembly, I was an assistant Cook County State's Attorney. I uh, worked at 26 in California. I may have served uh, on one of my juries. You may have gotten out of one of my juries. Uh, depends on what your committeeman, how good a committeeman you got, I guess. But uh, I also served as an assistant Illinois Attorney General. Uh, I served on a junior college board also in the uh, 19, uh, early 1990s, uh, Triton College Board of Trustees. Um, but I also am active in my community. I serve on the Misericordia Board of Advisors and a great little school out in Westmont called Giant Steps. It's a school for autism. They're, they're doing wonderful things out there to help uh, these families. But, uh, you know, the issues that I just talked about are really issues that I've been fighting for for the past seven and a half years in Springfield. Um, you know, national defense, you know, we want to keep our people safe. But you know, you want to keep our streets safe, and that's what I think I've got a great record in Springfield. Uh, the knowledge that I learned as an assistant Cook County State's Attorney has made me a, a very efficient legislator about knowing what laws work and what don't work in the courtrooms. Uh, many of the things that I've worked on are not the ones you see in headlines or the, uh, or the, or the, the fluffy pieces of legislation, but they're, they're, they're innovative, creative mechanisms which are getting results in courtrooms. And I think that's important because you know, you go in and you get the job done, and that's what I've been doing for the past seven and a half years. Uh, economy, you know, how do you do it? You know, you don't have to be a businessman to realize that, you know, that you need to make a friendly business environment, and that's what you need to do. We did that in Illinois, and I was proud to say I was part of that back in the, those fleeting years back when we were in the majority, back in the 1995 and 1996, by making Illinois a good business state. Uh, we did that by taking some of the, the vice grip that's been around, uh, you know, business community, including small businessmen, gave them the opportunity to expand, put people to work, put, uh, put food on the table. Um, education, that's always going to be an important, it's always a priority. And uh, I will say this, that I am a strong supporter of uh, uh, school choice, and I think that needs to be brought to, to the state level, but also to the national level. And that is something which I will advocate as a United States Senator. So, my time is running out, but uh, uh, I welcome uh, this opportunity. It'll be a wonderful uh, 45 minutes or however we got, but uh, I thank my opponents for, uh, for joining us today, and uh, thank you as well. Uh, we'll now hear from John Cox for three minutes. Uh, Joyce, can I just ask you to not start the clock yet, because I wanted to, to do something for my good friend Jim here. Uh, last week at the uh, College of the Page, uh, it was Jim's 41st birthday? 41st birthday, and uh, Jim mentioned that he was standing in between somebody who uh, had a ice cream company and somebody who had a potato chip company at one point. And uh, I figured, Jim, that you needed a present. Uh, uh, I figured, given that you've been down in Springfield so, for so long and served this state so well, uh, voting for all those great programs down there, we thought we'd give you a little pork. Welcome to the City Club. Wait, welcome to the City Club. I mean, we just said it 20th. Oh, all right, good. The, uh, the, the talk's starting now. Go ahead. All right, the clock's starting now. All kidding aside, I've been in this race for over a year now. I got out of this race because I didn't want, not because I wanted to sell ice cream, not because I'm a political insider wanting to get a job. I got into this race for three specific reasons. 
And those are my three daughters, Sarah, Stephanie, and Shannon. And I got into this race, I felt it was very important to do it because I want them to live in a country that's free and that has opportunity. And if I'm dedicated to one thing, that's what I'm dedicated to for my children as well as everybody's children. I've been going all around the state, as has been recounted in many times in the press, for over a year now, talking to people, listening, finding out the concerns and the ideas of the people of this great state. And I think that people all across the state of Illinois want something very important, and that is they want solutions. They don't want partisanship. They don't want sound bites. They don't want political endorsements. What really and truly they want is they want somebody who's a problem solver who will search for solutions, whether it is Democrat or Republican, no matter where it comes from. I'm proud of my background as well. I grew up in the city of Chicago. I think that's going to be a key in the general election. My mother was a Chicago public school teacher. My dad was a Chicago postman. I worked my way up. I started my own businesses, worked my way through college first, got my CPA certificate. There's only one CPA in the current U.S. Senate. Maybe that's why we have the problems we have and the budget that we have. I uh, started my own businesses, just myself and a secretary, and grew it and really became part of the American dream. I'm proud of the fact that I created jobs. I'm proud of the fact that I saved Jay's potato chips from bankruptcy. I'm also proud of the community service that I've been able to undergo and be involved in. I've been a school board president when I was 27 years old. I volunteered for a school board and became the president of that board. And we fought for lower class sizes and better standards. I also started a charity called Christmas in April, which last year repaired the homes of 45 elderly women, low income widows, basically, who couldn't repair the homes on their own. That's responsibility. That's the kind of commitment that I want to bring to the United States Senate. And as Jim mentioned, today is uh, Ronald Reagan's 91st birthday. As you see on your table, I want to continue the Reagan revolution. And that means that I'm going to stand for certain principles, a strong national defense. I think that's uppermost on the minds of Illinois citizens. Economic liberty, a government that doesn't tax us to death, government that doesn't regulate us to death. Sensible policy, that's what I'm talking about. And I'm also talking about personal responsibility and the defense of our Constitution, because that is the foundation of our country. I'm looking forward as well to the debate with my compatriots here. I look forward to your questions, and thank you for being here. Okay, uh, if you would uh, well, line up behind the gentleman over there, and all I, all I ask when you ask the question is uh, you state your name and uh, direct it, and I'll guide you a little bit uh, to make sure everyone gets the equal amount of questions. So, sir, state your name and your question. Michael Bauer. I'm a longtime City Club member. Uh, as a United States Senator, would you support a constitutional amendment to ban abortions, even in cases of rape or incest. Who is this question directed to, sir? Uh, uh, ask you all three. Well, let's start with Mr. Oberweiss. Mr. Oberweiss. As a father of five and grandfather of six, uh, I believe very strongly in the sanctity of life. Like George Bush, I believe that we must work to create a culture that values life at both ends of the spectrum, from the elderly to the unborn. And there are certain issues that would come potentially to me as a U.S. Senator. Those issues would include such things such as partial birth abortions, which I would certainly vote against, uh, things like uh, parental consent and notification, which I would certainly be for. Having said that, I have a great deal of respect for the framers of our Constitution. And as a conservative, I would be hesitant to vote for an amendment. Okay, Mr. Durkin, you have 60 seconds to respond. Sure. <clears throat> well, I've been actually voting on these issues for the past seven and a half years. And uh, I have voted to uh, ban partial birth abortions. I have voted for parental notification uh, time and time again. And I have voted uh, uh, to ban the Medicaid funding of abortions as well. Uh, the dialogue needs to get away from 
uh, legislation. How about uh, educating particularly young women and finding alternatives, uh, whether it's uh, adoption. There are, there are thousands of parents out there who would love to uh, take one of these children who don't have the ability to um, have their own children. Um, education in the schools, whether it's abstinence programs, those work. Uh, but I, uh, I, am a, uh, I, I consider myself pro-life, uh, and I do believe in uh, limited exceptions. Uh, I would, uh, I want to see, in a perfect world, I would like to see abortions not even be issued. Uh, I believe that uh, I would uh, be leaning to support an amendment of that nature. Mr. Cox, 60 seconds. Let me not equivocate, I would vote for the amendment. I'm the son of a single parent. I was raised by my mother for the first five years of my life. I know how tough it is to raise a child when you don't have help. It's all about responsibility. It's all about taking responsibility for what you do in life. It's about the right to an existence. I realize it's a very contentious issue. The debate ought to be about assistance to women. It ought to be about men taking responsibility. This shouldn't even be an issue because, of, as I've said many times, there can be reasonable disagreement about when life starts, conception or a few months later. But I would fall down on saying that if you're not sure, and believe me, there's no person in this world that's sure, I would err on the side of protecting life, just like I wanted to be protected when I was born. And I think that's where the debate should go. Let's protect women. Let's deal with responsibility. I'm not going to equivocate. You know, saying you're personally pro-life, but not in favor of an amendment, is like saying you're personally for freedom, but you think slavery is a good idea. I don't think anybody, anybody would be elected dog catcher if they had that attitude. You got to stand up for something. I will stand up for that, but I will also stand up for protecting women. Thank you. Okay. State your name. This question is to Mr. Durkin. Hello. My name is Michael O'Brien. Uh, my question is for Mr. Oberweiss. Well, he's got his question already. You want to reverse, go back in line, and somebody okay. else? Great. All right. Go get him, Paul. Uh, Grant, let's. That threw me off for Mr. Cox. Okay. <laughs> All right, you want to no, go no, back in line? No, we can, we no, can, we can, no, we can rotate. It's, 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 no, it's like a volleyball no, game, no, no problem. I'll, I'll go this way. Okay. Grant Linsky, City Club member. Uh, my question has to deal, uh, do with O'Hare. Mm -hmm. For operational efficiency, disregarding capacity, uh, do you support the reconfiguration of O'Hare's runway system, and why or why not? Uh, it's in my policy book, which you all no, no, have. No, 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 oh, excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was for me. No, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, I've, uh, excuse I, me. I am in favor of, uh, of the reconfiguration also about uh, creating a third airport as well. <laughs> and uh, uh, O'Hare is a tremendous economic uh, uh, engine for the, not only the city of Chicago, but for the nation. And uh, it needs to be brought up with the times. However, we can also live with the third airport. Uh, there is a need, and if you drive along the I-88s, 57 and 55 corridors, you'll see that that is where the population growth of this state is, uh, where it's uh, growing. And I believe you can live with both, and I would uh, be supportive of, uh, of those efforts. Now, Mr. Cox, you have 60 seconds to respond. I apologize. No for problem. There. No problem. Um, my two opponents have come out in favor of the expansion, clearly, uh, at the last debate uh, that we had. <laughs> I'm against the reconfiguration. I, I understand. I'm just. I'm, I understand. I am against the expansion. I am in favor of configuring the runways to be safer and to be more uh, uh, secure, as well as to be more efficient. I'm also for Western access, but I will tell you that we will never, ever get the growth that we need in this area unless we add capacity. The best place to add capacity is where we don't have it today and that's in the south and southwest suburbs. I come from that area. I grew up in Alsip, and I remember my parents having to drive a long way to get to an airport. We need economic growth in the <coughs> south and southwest suburbs. The six billion we're talking about at O'Hare is gonna be 20 billion before you can blink. It's another pork barrel project. Let's spend our scarce tax dollars where they do the best job, and I think that's in Piatone. We need to build Piatone first before we do the major improvements at O'Hare. That will furnish us with the capacity while O'Hare is down, and it will also mean that Piatone gets underway and is successful, and I think that's what we should uh, all be dedicated to. Mr. Oberweiss, you have 60 seconds. Ladies and gentlemen, O'Hare is a great asset of the state of Illinois. It's one of the best airports, the leading airports in the entire world. 
we must do whatever is necessary to accommodate the growth in traffic that we're going to have in the next 20 or 30 years. And I'm not going to equivocate and try to play both sides of the coin like that. I think it's clear that we must meet those needs of the future. Now, having said that, I'm not at all sure that the George Ryan Mayor Daley plan that has been proposed is the right plan. I'm also a private pilot. I understand these issues. And the FAA has indicated that the proposed plan, limited details that have been available so far, does not meet their safety requirements. And I think that above all has to take priority. The runway separation would be as little as 1,300 feet under the proposed plan for parallel runways. The FAA recommends a minimum of 2,500 feet separation for safety purposes. We've got to make sure that this is safe for all travelers. In addition to that, planes might have to cross as many as two active runways in order to get to the terminal before or after landing or before taking off. That is also not a recommended procedure. So I think we need to look at this carefully, get the right plan, let it be aired out and not tacked in or added onto some other bill and let people understand what it's all about. I do think there is also a need for a third airport wherever the best location for that might be. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is for uh, Mr. Cox. Uh, Mr. Overweis questionnaire, you could pass again if you like. Uh, Mr. Sullivan. Yes, Professor. Terry Sullivan, also a City Club member. Um, I have a question that uh, some at our table are very concerned about that has, for Mr. Cox and the others, that has to do with um, the fact that Illinois now has uh, a law for background checks at gun shows. Mm -hmm. Yet the federal government does not, and as you probably all know, that there is a bill that's pending right now. What would each of your positions be as to closing that loophole through the federal law? Thank Mr. You. Cox, 90 seconds. I believe that we need to have insta-check. The way the the way you solve crime is to make sure that guns don't fall into the hands of criminals or the mentally ill. I can get my visa approved in about 10 seconds at the Walmart or any other store uh, anywhere. And if we devote the resources to InstaCheck, you'll be able to tell instantly if someone has a felony record. And my crime proposals were just endorsed on Monday by the state's attorney of Winnebago County, Paul Ogley who has been a leader in fighting crime. What we don't need are we don't need laws in Springfield that limit prosecutors' authority. We need tools to allow prosecutors to do the job. And we need to get tough on criminals who use guns in the commission of crimes. Project Exile in Richmond, Virginia has had remarkable success, about 40% drop in violent crime. Politicians talk and talk and talk about taking away the constitutional rights of people, but they don't talk about putting criminals behind bars. I am going to stand in this campaign for the end of that talk and the start of a, a dialogue about getting judges and prosecutors to do their job, put criminals away, make prisoners work in prison, no health clubs and uh, mini bars, and enforce the law, send a message to the population that we are going to enforce the law, we are going to take criminals off the street. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Durkin, you have 60 seconds to respond. Well, I think all of us probably agree we want to eliminate uh, uh, guns in the hands of, uh, of felons and uh, people who have the wrong intentions. Uh, enforcing the existing laws is important, but uh, the uh, direct answer to the question is that uh, I would support the federal legislation. Mr. Oberweiss, 60 seconds to respond. I think our focus has to be on being sure that criminals don't obtain guns, not that law-abiding citizens don't obtain guns. And in fact, uh, I believe we have a fairly good system, a fairly good uh, law today, if it were enforced. And I believe the question is about uh, purchasing guns at gun shows and whether or not the individual must have an instant background check. The same is true at a gun show as is true on the street or any other place. If you are a dealer, you must have an instant background check immediately. If you sell a gun to a neighbor or a friend uh, or an acquaintance and you are not a dealer and you're doing it on an occasional, not regular, not business-like basis, you are not required to have an instant check. I think that's a, a reasonable uh, law, a reasonable situation, and the focus must be on increasing penalties for criminals who use guns illegally. Okay, now, are you ready? 
Yes, sir. I may have to pass you. Okay, go ahead. State your name, though. State your name. Michael O'Brien. My question is for Mr. Oberweiss. I've, I've been a longtime customer of your products. Uh-oh. <laughs> I've eaten your ice cream for years, as, as you can plainly see. So, <laughs> so have I, as you can see. <laughs> but until you announced your candidacy, I've never heard any radio commercials touting the Oberweiss name and seeking job applicants. Is this radio spot something that will continue running after your campaign, or do you anticipate that all the jobs will be filled by then? <laughs> well, number one, I don't think all the jobs will be filled because uh, we're opening ice cream stores number 22 and number 23 in uh, Glenview and St. Louis and number 24 in Lake Zurich all within the next few months. So we'll be continuing to look for more employees. And I apologize if you haven't heard the commercials before, but in fact, we've been running them for several years. And in fact, it has been very difficult to find enough employees to man those stores over the last several years because we've been growing so quickly and because the employment market has been very tight. But as a matter of fact, the employment market has been loosening slightly and we're able to attract more and more employees and, and build that base that we need. So the answer to your question is, if you haven't heard the commercials, you just haven't been listening to the right radio stations at the right time. We've been doing it for several years. Thank you. I would assume that neither Mr. Cox or Mr. Durkin. I don't want to dare you. Don't own dairy. You know, I tell you what, though, I got to hand it to Jim. I mean, he's got a great business idea. I mean, he's getting name recognition all across the state. I think that's great. All right. I'm, he's a I'm, smart I'm, businessman, smarter than I am. And I'm sure he makes you feel good. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, let's, have, let's have the next question up. And this question uh, is for uh, Mr. Durkin. No, Mr. Cox. Mm. I, okay. This is a very select crowd. Step right up, young man, for Mr. Durkin. Uh, I'm Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the Midwest High Speed Rail Coalition. Oh, our there requisite high speed rail question. Okay, yes. <laughs> you, you know, there are standard topics O'Hare, rail, high speed rail, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, communities all through Illinois are, are trying to get better, faster train service in order to get to downtown Chicago and to O'Hare Airport. Um, nationwide, there's growing support for faster and better trains. Despite this, Amtrak has threatened to cut service to all of the communities in Illinois that have Amtrak service now um, and will dramatically reduce the level of service in Chicago um, due to a lack of federal funding. What will you do if elected um, to put together a true funding program for fast, frequent, comfortable trains? Thank you. Mr. Dorkin, you have 90 seconds. Well, I think first, uh, Amtrak needs to be held accountable. They've been uh, coming down to Springfield for years seeking uh, uh, financial assistance. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that they need to uh, prove to whether it's uh, state legislature or the federal government that, uh, uh, that the money they're using is, uh, is being used appropriately. Uh, you know, it, there, there are transportation issues uh, about whether or not uh, people are, are going to be flying planes over the next year is something which remains to be seen. Uh, uh, but uh, it is a uh, it is a Amtrak is just one of a larger uh, issue dealing with fast uh, uh, with with, with uh, high speed rail. Uh, you know that is something which we're going to have to see you have to go further out in the western suburbs. As I said before, the population growth is moving in that way. Uh, and those people, a lot of them, still live in the city of Chicago. So we're going to have to expand the metro uh, and move further west. But uh, Amtrak, yes, uh, come in, make your case. But uh, I don't think that it should be a, a direct handout. And uh, um, they need to be held accountable. As I said, they've come down every year to Springfield looking for money. And uh, there really has been uh, uh, no one has, has put up the task yet about the, uh, the efficiency of the way they're operating their, uh, uh, their trains. Mr. Cox, you have 60 seconds. About a year ago when I started this campaign, I took Amtrak down to Pontiac to go to a Lincoln Day dinner. And I swear I saw turtles passing me by. Uh, Amtrak needs to, a lot of work, and uh, high-speed rail, I believe, is the answer for the future. I have met with uh, people from Siemens and other companies that are talking about a hub-and-spoke network there, where Chicago is the hub, and you've got spokes going to M Minneapolis, uh, St. Louis, Indianapolis. Forty percent of the flights out of O'Hare are less than two hours, and uh, that could be well served by high-speed rail. High-speed rail is cleaner. It doesn't use as much energy. It doesn't have anything to do with the weather. The, uh, I've traveled quite a bit in Europe. Uh, I've ridden the Channel. Uh, that was an experience, as well as the TGV in uh, France. 
And uh, the Europeans and the Japanese have both used high-speed rail very effectively. There is one thing I know for sure, and that is if we spend 10 or 20 billion dollars trying to double the size of O'Hare, we're not going to have any money left over for high-speed rail. Let's use our money wisely. Let's use it to build a Piatone airport, get a high-speed rail network that uh, will serve in between those airports as well as uh, many major cities around the uh, Midwest, and I think we'll do a lot for solidifying uh, Chicago's place as a transportation leader. Uh, the high-speed rail is the future. I've even seen designs that would have a monorail, a couple monorails that's over the existing railroad right away. The trouble right now with Amtrak is that our rail bed is 100 years old in many places, and you know you're talking about billions and billions of dollars to repair that. Uh, you know maybe a monorail over uh, existing rail lines and right-of-ways is the way to go. Let's explore that. Mr. Oberweis, you have 60 seconds to give a response. Great, I don't think I'll even need that, uh, that long. Quite frankly, as a U.S. Senator, I would work to make sure that more of our tax dollars come back to Illinois. For years, many more dollars have gone from, US tax, from Illinois taxpayers to Washington that have not come back. It's time that we equalize that. I'm not looking for a big share. I'm not looking for pork, just a fair share of dollars coming back. And transportation is one of the areas that should be a recipient of those dollars. I think that we should be using the federal government to test that opportunity, to test the possibility of high-speed rail, to help perhaps with land acquisition. But it's got to make economic sense. This idea of creating train systems that people don't want doesn't make any sense. The federal government should not be in the business of maintaining Pony Express or uh, wagons that will take people from one town to another if the demand is no longer there. Let's make sure they're economically feasible. If they're not economically feasible, let the private sector try to make sense of it. Get the government out of that service. I believe there are people out there who could provide rail service on an economic basis that would make sense for this country and let private industry do it, not government. Okay. I agree. Okay, now, a uh, question for Mr. Cox. State your name, sir. My name is John Magrowski. Mm -hmm. Question for Mr. Cox. You have stated that you did not support the death penalty for Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh. Would you also not support the death penalty for terrorist Osama bin Laden, who masterminded the terrorist attacks that murdered 3,000 innocent citizens? You know, I, I agree with uh, Joe Burkett, who uh, recently was uh, quoted in the newspaper as saying that uh, Marilyn Lemack is probably going to suffer a whole lot more being in jail for the next uh, uh, 50 years or so. Uh, I do favor the death penalty in times of war. I think the purpose of war is to kill the enemy. Uh, that's an exception. Uh, that's self-defense, as far as I'm concerned. War is self-defense, and I believe you do have a right to use force, and you do have a right to use uh, equal force and death if necessary. It cost us something like $20 million to kill Timothy McVeigh and make him a martyr. He should have been working and breaking rocks for the next 60 or 70 years, and, uh, and we wouldn't have had a lot of the problems that we were talking about uh, in the newspapers every day with uh, wrongful death penalty convictions and other things like that. Uh, we wouldn't have all this debate. Let's make crime something that is punished. Uh, I favor uh, life without parole. I favor uh, punishment for criminals. I think it would be a lot more uh, damaging to have someone live uh, and work hard for 50 years remembering the lives that they took. I don't have any love loss for Timothy McVeigh. My belief is that life is sacred and uh, there's only one being that can take life, uh, and again, unless it's self-defense or in the time of war, and that's self-defense. Uh, let's focus the debate on stopping crime. Let's get away from the emotionalism. Let's enforce the law. Let's put criminals in jail. Let's make jail somewhere where people have to work as hard as I do in the private sector. It's very simple. Um, as a U.S. Senator, however, I will enforce the law. Uh, I think Governor Ryan's moratorium was illegal. The legislature spoke, despite my personal views, the legislature spoke, the governor should have enforced the law, uh, but uh, let's focus on punishing criminals and uh, saving tax dollars. Mr. Oberweiss, you have 60 seconds. I happen to be one of those who is very concerned about seeing someone put to death if they're innocent. Fortunately, Technology today is improving with DNA testing and, and other forms of technology that will allow us 
to better check and make sure that somebody is guilty. But if they're guilty, and if in fact uh, we can recognize that, and if in fact the death penalty acts as a deterrent, then I think it's important that we look at the victims of crime and have more compassion and more help for the victims of crime than the criminals themselves. So to the degree that the death penalty acts as a deterrent to those types of criminals who would commit the very most serious of crimes, then I think, in fact, it makes a lot of sense. Mr. Dorkin, you have 60 seconds. Well, whether it's a deterrent or not, I, you know, I don't think that's quite the, uh, the debate should be going that way. It's the only appropriate punishment for individuals like Timothy McVeigh, who uh, in, uh, in, in one day destroyed families and uh, has ruined lives. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I will support the families and the, and the victims of people who have to live for the rest of their lives uh, in pain and in and suffering, uh, but that is the only way to respond to a crime of that nature. And Osama bin Laden, when he's captured, if he's alive, should be tried and should be sentenced to death. I support the death penalty. I'm the uh, one up here. I do have concerns about uh, wrongful convictions, and I've been at the forefront of that for the past two and a half years uh, on a special committee uh, in Springfield, uh, which has addressed each one of these issues. I would like to see the moratorium lifted. Every one of my proposals went to the heart of it uh, about the unreliable uh, jailhouse informant testimony, uh, unreliable eyewitness testimony, and also the problems dealing with the non-disclosure of exculpatory evidence. But uh, those are issues which I think uh, are important. Uh, they're so important because I received the endorsement of those, uh, those leg that legislation from the uh, Chicago Police, uh, uh, no, the Chiefs of Police Association, the State's Attorneys of, uh, uh, State's Attorney Association, the uh, sheriff of Cook County, the Sheriff of, uh, of Kane County, the Illinois Sheriff's Association. Uh, law enforcement wants truth, and uh, we, but also they want appropriate penalties. So you can do both, and that's what I plan to do in the United States Senator. Okay. Question for Mr. Oberweiss. My name is Gary McDougall, a longtime businessman and hardcore Republican uh, activist. Good for you. Uh, we um, Republicans don't talk as much as we should about problems of disadvantaged people. That's my view. So I'd like to raise that at this time. Um, most of you know that we spend a lot of money at the federal level, and if you, either any of you get to be a senator, and I hope one of you will, it's 380 billion is what we spent last year, which is, ranks with the Defense Department budget. The question is, with the Gingrich-inspired welfare reform coming up for reauthorization this year, what thoughts do you have on the future of welfare reform and any other comments you might have on human services for the disadvantaged? Thank you. Mr. Oberweiss, you have 90 seconds. Thank you. Um, I believe that welfare reform has moved in the right direction. We have gotten people from welfare to jobs. And I think most Americans, not all, but most Americans would definitely prefer a paycheck to a welfare check. So the degree that we can create more jobs and create opportunities for people I think we take a step in the right direction. And I think that's really what my campaign has been about, making sure the economy is moving forward, that customer co consumer confidence is renewed, and that jobs are available for people who want to work. Having said that, uh, let me just mention a few things that I've done personally that I think uh, fit in with that. And, and I believe uh, that government has a role, but each of us as individuals have a significant role as well. Uh, I started uh, a charitable foundation called the Oberweiss Foundation, which my family has funded. We have made funds available to a wide variety of charitable sources, including uh, the Hesed House in Aurora, which takes care of the absolute bottom line, uh, those homeless people who just don't have any food or, or any place to stay. And I think that we as individuals must do everything we can to help support those people. And I think it's better if we do it than if the government does it. We've done other things. Uh, Oberweiss Dairy, for instance, uh, has created a scholarship program for the kids that work in our ice cream stores. We will give every kid that works in every one of our stores $750 for each year they work in one of our stores to any college of their choice, no requirements other than that whatsoever. They can choose the college, they can choose the higher education area that they want to focus on. Uh, there's no test, no, no requirements. We provide that for them just because we think it's the right thing to do, because we value education, we value helping kids. And we also make similar scholarships available for the kids of our farmers who ship milk to us as well. Uh, Mr. Durkin, 60 seconds to sure. respond. 
Well, I was in the legislature when we passed welfare reform back in 1995, and it worked. It put people back to work. It, uh, uh, it lightened the welfare rolls. But however, uh, it's going to be coming back up, and uh, one of the proposals, which is in Springfield, is going to allow for uh, uh, the TANF recipients to receive some type of uh, payments that will reflect the cost of inflation. Uh, and I think that that will be met with success. Uh, but for the disadvantage, I mentioned earlier, I serve on two boards. One of them is uh, Misericordia. Another one is a giant step school for autism. So I have a great interest in helping uh, the disadvantaged. Uh, and I've been doing that in Springfield uh, for the, my, my tenure. And I will take that commitment to Washington. But if any of you know Sister Rosemary Connolly, uh, she's a tough, uh, tough cookie. And if I go to Washington, she's a tough person to say no to. So uh, uh, you're right. It but it comes down to a... Uh, a, a dedication, really a priority by government to ensure that uh, the, you know, the that people who are disadvantaged at least have the minimum, uh, have a, a basic quality of life, which all of us, uh, you know, we, we want for our, our, our family members. Uh, but that's, uh, that's, once again, it's, it's got to be made a priority and a commitment from the members of the congressional delegations. Mr. Cox, you have 60 seconds. You know, uh, next week I'll be issuing uh, an addendum to my uh, policy position papers dealing with welfare reform. and. Uh, Gary, you've written a great book called Make a Difference that details a lot of the problems with welfare and solutions, I believe, to the problem. Uh, and the solutions lie in reforming the structure, not throwing more money at it, but reforming the structure, dealing with the fact that we need to have the goal being self-sufficiency. And the system is geared now to just keeping agencies in business a lot of times. Uh, a lot of the times the bureaucracy doesn't coordinate with each other. Substance abuse, job training, psychiatric testing it might be in three different areas, uh, as you correctly point out in the book. I've been on the front lines uh, in this connection. I started this charity Christmas in April because I wanted to take care of people who couldn't take care of themselves. Um, I've been on the board of Boys Hope, Girls Hope, uh, which is a charity that devoted to inner city youth and giving them an opportunity to a good education. When it all comes down to is a good education. And I've campaigned on the west and the south sides of Chicago extensively already in the year that I've been in this campaign. And when I talk to the, in those areas, I'm talking about breaking the cycle of poverty with a good education. You know, Republicans were criticized for welfare reform until we really started to talk about the compassion of a good job and the compassion of self-sufficiency. And I think that's up. where we need to devote ourselves. Okay, Mr. Thank Oberweiss, you, you have uh, 60 seconds, sir. Oh, you started. Professor Green occasionally makes errors okay. I was watching Ms. Saxon. All right, a question for Mr. Durkin. And thank you all for paying so close attention. I do appreciate that. You had me worried for a second. Well, listen, you're not yeah. the first person that said that. Uh, I'm uh, Marty well Gleason. Republican uh, operative, yes. State your name, please. <laughs> yeah. I'm Marty Gleason, City Club member, lifelong Democrat. Uh, in light Excuse of the you. Enron mess, uh, would you discuss your position on, number one, McCain-Feingold, and number two, on privatizing or reforming Social Security, a la George Bush's recommendations for private investment of funds of Social Security? Who is this for? Uh, this is for Mr. Durkin. I'm, on, okay. I'm, back, I'm back on form. I'm back are on you, form. Are you all set with this? Yeah, I am. I am. Yeah, I've, right. uh, I've said in the past I would support McCain-Feingold. Uh, and... Uh, Enron is a, uh, I mean, that's a horrible situation. People have been, uh, uh, I mean, there's criminal actions which, uh, which happen to these, these, these pensioners, and they, I think that uh, the FBI, SEC needs to do their job and get in and start this process and, and bring people to justice. Uh, the, um, this is going to, there needs to be a broader look at the, uh, the accounting methods, the, the uh, the fiduciary relationships and whether the laws are appropriate to ensure that this will never happen again. Conflicts between accounting firms and also board of directors. This is going to cause corporate America to uh, look uh, closely at the relationships that they have with uh, who, when they should be taking an objective uh, uh, position on it, uh, when they're in those relationships. Social Security form, uh, I think we all know that 2015 and somewhere around that year, we expect that there will be uh, shortcomings. Uh, there has been a, uh, you know, that this has become the third rail of, of politics, so to speak. And, uh, but uh, first and foremost, there has to be uh, a dedication by government to ensure to keep their commitments, which they made a number of years ago. And uh, also, uh, you cannot take away from the trust fund. Uh, I would 
think it's wise to look at a very limited PSA personal savings account uh, under a very uh, uh, a limited type of situation for that private investment. Uh, these are things which uh, I, I think need to be discussed at a greater length. I know the commission just came back uh, with those types of recommendations, uh, but I think it needs further discussion. Mr. Cox, you have 60 seconds. Uh, I would not vote for McCain-Feingold. I believe the problem in, with money in politics is the fact that the money is too concentrated, not that there's too much money in politics. In the, in the year 2000, we spent $2 billion on all federal, state, and local races. We spent $8 billion on potato chips. I think politics is a lot more important than potato chips, even though I did own a potato chip company at one point. Uh, the Enron controversy, I'm one of those unlucky people that lost money in Enron. As an investment advisor, that's my primary business. As a CPA, uh, I was fooled along with Citibank and J.P. Morgan and a lot of the smartest minds in America. The problem with Enron was not the political contributions they made. They got very little for it, as much as the partisans in Washington try to make of that. The issue with Enron was not telling the truth and not presenting fairly your financial statements and finagling and putting your losses offshore and telling half the truth. What we need to do is we need to tell all the truth. And we need to make sure that accountants do that, that we don't reward uh, game playing and complex arrangements that try to hide losses and assets. Enron, who knows, may have technically complied with the law. The issue is not that. It's not the definition of is, as we learned from the Clinton administration, or the definition of sex. It's doing the right thing and being truthful in the full, to the fullest extent, and putting a proper position in, uh, in front of the people. Mr. Oberweiss, 60 seconds. I think the uh, plan sponsors for the Enron 401k plan violated basic rights, basic common sense. The investors and potential future retirees of Enron should never been allowed to invest the vast majority of those funds in their own company stock. Not only were they allowed to, they were encouraged to. A simple rule from ERISA explaining and mentioning and encouraging and requiring diversification among 401k plan assets is common sense, necessary, basic financial planning. Uh, this is nothing uh, very, uh, very complicated. Investors have a great deal of their own personal capital tied up in companies they work for. They can't have all the retirement plan assets in the same thing. In fact, if a company is making uh, matching contributions in company stock, uh, company stock should not be one of the investment choices for those individuals. So I think, uh, I think that was a great error that got away. That should never be allowed to happen again. And I think uh, George Bush is going in the right uh, direction on that very clearly. And I'm glad to hear that uh, uh, my opponent, Jim uh, Durkin, was supporting uh, McCain Feingold. Oh, we finally found something we can disagree on. Uh, yeah. Although that means I have to agree with John, I guess, so it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not perfect. I'm sorry, I guess I'm out okay. of Okay. That little love session there. Okay, uh, you have the last question. It'll be 60 seconds per person because we want to make this totally fair. So state your name and just throw the question out. We'll start with Mr. Oberweiss and we'll go right down the row. Well, this is really for Mr. Durkin. I was just... Well, 60 seconds for everybody. Well, since hindsight is 2020, and you look back and you can see what the Illinois FIRST program has done, not only to the state politics, but to our party as well and how it's split it. Would you rethink your vote on that and, and not alienating the conservatives the way that, that we did so fast right after a conservative uh, won election and go back on every promise that he made? Would you have rethought your, your position on we Illinois FIRST? We got your first? question. Mr. Durkin, you have 60 seconds. Everyone else has 60 seconds. Well, you know, there hasn't been a major road project, uh, uh, infrastructure project in, uh, in decades in Illinois. And uh, these are the tough decisions you got to make when you're in the legislature and in Washington. And uh, uh, by and far, it is the uh, uh, roads need to be uh, smooth, trucks need to deliver goods, people need to drive the work, uh, trains need to bring people uh, to the city and to, to shop and go to work. Uh, Perhaps, but I think that by and large, I, I, I live in an area where they're uh, right off the Eisenhower Expressway uh, that needed to be worked on. Uh, and, but I think the economy is uh, needed uh, a major road project. Uh, uh, it's not a perfect system, but uh, no, I, I support Illinois First. I, I, and I'm not the uh, uh, least bit uh, having would rethink my uh, vote on that. Mr. Cox, you have 60 seconds. Well, I'm amazed at that because we have uh, 
centers for uh, learning disabled and for uh, people, uh, hospitals uh, closing all over the state because of Illinois First and the pork that represented that. And with all due respect, Jim, uh, you were appointed to your position as a state legislator uh, and uh, you've been a consistent vote for uh, casino gambling, for the casino deals, for the liquor tax, for the license tax, for all the deals that uh, have really made the public sick and cynical. And uh, I appreciate the fact that you're down there and you've got to get along. But what we need in Washington is someone who's going to stand up to political pressure, who's not doing it to get a job, who has the best interest of the country at heart. Uh, I have that. As I've said before, I'm not promoting my businesses. I'm not doing this to get a job. I believe in this country. I believe that we need to have some measure of fiscal discipline in Washington. And uh, we need to have somebody who stands up for the right things. I've met people all across the state who told me that they had to dream up ways to spend Illinois First money. Either that or it would go someplace else. They had to really come up with ways to put a scoreboard at a soccer field or something, because if they didn't spend the Illinois First money, it was going to be spent somewhere else. That's ridiculous, and I, I think we saw in the Tribune article this weekend uh, how much pork okay. was spread around the state of Illinois. Mr. Oberweiss, you have 60 seconds. The question is Illinois first. And I think the question was integrity as well and uh, not following up on, on one's word. And let me say that I've spent the last 15 years as a mutual fund portfolio manager. During that period of time, on a very regular basis, almost daily, I make commitments for our funds. I may buy a half a million dollars or a million dollars worth of a stock over the phone based on one thing, my word. And Many times I've been wrong and the stock has gone the other way and I wish I could change my mind and say, oh no, I didn't make that trade. But the second I did that, my word would be worth nothing. I've learned the value of my word. I've learned the value of commitment. And you have my commitment to live up to everything that I say. I will stand behind it. I will be good for it. And I will be back regularly after I'm elected to the U.S. Senate to talk to you about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Here we go. Let's have a round of applause before we go to the final round. Anyone? You go first again, Jim. You're on, you're, you go third. You go third. Okay. All right. It's Jim, John, and Jim. Two minutes. Topic being to close. Why I would be my party's best candidate for the U.S. Senate in November. Well, I think that's a great closing subject, and it's one of my favorite subjects. And I think the answer to that is really very basic. I believe that I am the one candidate among the three who has put together the right manpower, the right team to get elected, who has the right mission to get elected, and who has the capability to put together the financial resources that will be necessary to get the message out to Illinois voters as to what Dick Durbin's voting record has been. And for those of you who don't know, Dick Durbin has been voted by NFIB, Chamber of Commerce, and other sources as a more liberal U.S. Senator than Teddy Kennedy. I don't think that fits with Illinois voters. He's voted against every military preparedness bill in the five years he's been in the U.S. Senate. He could get away with that before September 11th. We can't let him get away with that anymore. He voted against George Bush's tax cut plan. He's voted against the removal of nuclear waste from Illinois because of a deal with Bill Clinton. This gentleman does not represent Illinois voter views. I believe I'm the one candidate that Dick Durbin is concerned about. Dick Durbin has sent out a fundraising letter, in fact I have a copy of it right here, where he names one Republican candidate, me. And he says, basically, send money to me, Dick Durbin, right now. The Republicans have st stooped to such a level that they've recruited millionaire businessman Jim Oberweiss to run against me. It's important that you send your funds now because this is a real challenge and this U.S. Senate seat is important. And he's right about that. It is important. With that seat, the Democrats can block the Bush plan and the Republican plan to pass legislation. So it is important that we win in November. I believe I'm the one candidate that can do it. 
With the filing, uh, we showed a little over a million dollars in our bank, and I'd like to ask the other two candidates to address the financial issue in their closing remarks, because according to the filings, I believe they had less than a combined $50,000 under the FEC filing at the end of the year. Okay, your time is up. Uh, now we have uh, John Cox. Two minutes on the topic. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I don't have Dick Durbin's uh, endorsement, so that's one thing. Uh, Actually, John, that's not true. Reason, you do have his I endorsement. Think there's, excuse me. It's my time, Mr. Oberweiss. Yes, it is. And while I'm at it, Mr. Oberweiss, you have a problem with the truth, because you don't tell the whole truth. You know that there are newspaper articles out there that, has, that say I had a million dollars in an account, but you persist in running around saying that I don't have the financial resources. We don't need another Bill Clinton. We need somebody who's going to tell the whole truth and the whole truth. Yes. So in any event, uh, I am in this race because I want to tell the truth and because I want to focus on issues. And I want to focus on the ability to win in November. I've been out working since last January, getting my name all across this state. I have accumulated endorsements from many groups, from county chairs around the state, uh, who have recognized that I have the financial resources as well as the work ethic to get this job done. I have put my ideas in writing. Uh, nobody else has done that. I have given interviews all across the state to get the word out, to get my name recognition up. I've put together a team. Uh, Jim uh, Oberweiss may have a lot of high-priced consultants, but I have people on the front lines, a grassroots organization. I have 15 coordinators in areas all across the state. I have coordinators in every one of the 102 counties. I've built a grassroots network, and Dick Durbin is plenty worried about my ability to talk about the issues and to put issues before the, Amer the Illinois people. That's what this campaign should be about. It should be about issues. It should be about solutions to problems. I'm going to make it that. I'm going to continue to carry this campaign to every corner of this state. I believe that when we lead as Republicans, we win. Ronald Reagan, who is 91 years old today, stood on principles. He had a set of principles. I'm living on those principles as well. I'm going to be talking about solving problems for the people of Illinois, not selling a product or trying to get a job as a political insider. I've got the experience. I'm the only one of the three of us who's running a federal race. I ran for Congress two years ago. I've got the experience to get the job done, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Mr. Durkin, two Thank minutes. You. I'm the only one who's going to be able to beat Dick Durbin in November. Uh, uh, I am, unlike my two opponents, I'm like the 99% who are not millionaires. But uh, my campaign is about working with the moms and dads, the firemen, uh, the policemen, the businessmen, the small businessmen. Those are the ones who are supporting my candidacy. Members of the House of Representatives, uh, 48 of them have endorsed my candidacy. I have endorsements uh, from all reaches throughout the state. Uh, if that. Uh, you know, the, the political insider, that, that's fine. But you know what? Uh, it's the precinct captains who are going out are going to be working for me. And, uh, you know, that's important. And uh, I'll take that any day of the week. But uh, this is going to be an election about leadership, leadership which has been abandoned by Dick Durbin on the issues which we've talked about, about military, about uh, the, our economy. Uh, the United States Senate is a place for its statesmen, not a political blocker. And I'm very disappointed with the way that uh, Dick Durbin has uh, handled himself. And that's why I'm running. Uh, that's a place where bipartisan cooperation is important, no matter who is in the majority. That is what I've done in Springfield for the past seven years, and that's why I've been a very productive member of the General Assembly. And I've been fighting for the issues that are important to the party and to the state, about lowering taxes, providing jobs, and keeping our neighborhoods safe. And to the same extent, those are the issues that are important in Washington. Uh, and to challenge a man whose record, I think, does not represent the will of the people of the state, you need to have a record which is strong and which is consistent in that way. And uh, that is why at the end of the day, I believe I'm the strongest candidate, and uh, I, my time is running out, but uh, finances are an issue, but you know we're raising money, and uh, we'll be there, we'll be competitive, but uh, I'll take the mom and dad and their votes uh, all day long, as opposed to having the, um, uh, the, the millionaire uh, consultants uh, you know, sitting in the room with cigars. But uh, I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, this will be a great uh, few months, a uh, few days ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you. Nice round of applause.